Okay. And I am very happy and excited to introduce the next slammer. The next slammer is Martin. He's a postdoctoral researcher at the Cardiovascular Biomechanics Computation Lab at Stanford University. Martin, good luck on the stage is yours. Hi, and good morning, everyone from California. I want to start my talk today with a little experiment. If I gave you this wet towel and told you to dry it the most efficient way possible, what would you do? Would you just push on it? Or would you probably do something like that? You would twist it. And that, in fact, is exactly how the heart is working. So the muscle fibers are wrapped around the left and right ventricle in a helical structure, just like the sweat towel we just saw. And so with only 20% of muscle fiber shortening, the heart is able to eject 65% of its blood within every heartbeat by using this mechanical advantage. And so by, by training, I'm a mechanical engineer. And you may ask yourself, why is a mechanical engineer interested in the heart? And in fact, I did my PhD on computational modeling of cardiac mechanics. So what is a computational model of the heart? In its center, you can see the geometry that we take from the patient's medical imaging data. Then we also include the muscle fiber orientation that you just saw on the previous slide. And we have material models that describe the variant different tissues within the heart, describing their stiffness and electrical connectivity. And with that, we are able to predict the electrical signal the tissue contraction, and finally, the blood that is ejected from the heart. However, when I started my PhD, there was one big unknown um, in our model that researchers hadn't really looked into. Namely, what are the mechanical boundary conditions on the outside of the heart? How is the heart supported in space? And to find out about that, we will take one step back and look at a section of the heart. And we obviously see that the heart is not floating freely in space. So in the center, we have the heart itself and surrounding it is the pericardium that is here cut open. Um, pericardium is Greek for around the heart and is a thin but tough sac that fully encloses the heart. And what you can see in this picture is that there's a thin film of fluid that is between heart and pericardium. And to find out what that fluid is doing, we're going to perform a second experiment. I have two glass plates here, one representing the pericardium and one representing the heart. And as between heart and pericardium, there's a thin film of fluid between the two glass plates. And we can see the two glass plates slide easily relative to each other. However, when I let go of the glass plate, it sticks. They do, they do not separate due to the adhesive forces between the two glass plates. And that is exactly what is happening in the heart between the pericardium. On one hand, the pericardium provides frictionless sliding between when the heart contracts. And since that movement happens about 90,000 times a day, we want that movement to be as smooth as possible. At the same time, the pericardium makes sure the heart always stays in place. And exactly that is modeled by pericardial bounding conditions on the surface of the heart. They allow frictionless sliding in tangential direction, but they offer support in normal direction. So let's test our hypothesis. How do pericardial bounding conditions influence cardiac contraction? So here we compare a medical image of the fully contracted heart to the prediction of our model shown here in blue. We can see that on the left, without the pericardial, the model contracts inward and doesn't really match the outer shape of the heart. Whereas with the pericardium on the right, we can observe that model and image match nicely on the outside of the heart as well as on the inside. So we can see that pericardial boundary conditions are essential to correctly predict the contraction of the heart. And this leads me to the final big question. Why do we even want to predict cardiac contraction? A common complication in patients with heart failure is an asynchronousy of the heart, where the cardiac muscle cells don't really contract in a synchronized manner. And a promising way to fix that is cardiac resynchronization therapy, which is similar to a pacemaker. However, we know from studies that about 30% of patients do not respond to the therapy. So they took a very invasive and expensive procedure and did not benefit from it at all. And with a patient-specific cardiac model, we want to predict early on who is going to benefit from a therapy and who not. 
And that way we avoid unnecessary interventions and choose the best therapy for each patient. And with that, I want to thank everyone who supported me during my PhD research at TU Munich and to help me prepare this presentation today. Thank you.